All right, so we have two speakers coming up. Ian Elwood uh, works to reform social and economic systems that contribute to the suffering of domesticated and free roaming animals. He has worked for environmental and social justice nonprofits such as the International Rivers, Corp Watch, and Media Alliance. He is co founder of the new organization Neighbors Opposed to Backyard Slaughter out of Oakland. And we also have Colleen Patrick Goudreau. She is an award winning author with five books. Uh, she has been guiding people to becoming and staying vegan for over 12 years through sold out cooking classes, inspiring lectures, engaging videos, and her immensely unpopular audio podcast, Vegetarian Food for Thought. She also contributes to National Public Radio and the Christian Science Monitor, and has appeared on the Food Network and PBS. So we are very grateful for both of them to be here to talk to us about urban free animal farming, compassion for all, Please welcome Ian Elwood and Colleen Patrick Goudreau. Uh, thanks so much, Hope, for having us today. We really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, can you hear me okay? Okay, a little bit louder. So. Um, thanks everyone for coming today. Um, in the next hour, Colleen and I will be telling you about the, the work that we're doing to advocate for a humane and sustainable urban farming policy in Oakland, uh, with the hopes that the lessons learned from this, uh, what we've learned, can inform people working to create similar policies in other cities. Sure, um, I'll do my best. Uh, maybe the mic could crank just a little bit. Um, that would be perfect. So um, today, basically, I'll be presenting two case studies from our work. Uh, showing the issues we see with uh, the urban farming of animals and um, ba basically the way that, that, that we've seen things um, come down in Oakland and El Cerrito and, and the region that, uh, with this issue. Um, so, as you know, urban farming is a, a pretty hot topic right now, and many cities see it as the solution to food insecurity and food injustice. As urban farming becomes more popular, there is a tendency to to want to add animals onto the farm after people get the hang of growing vegetables. The perception is that this is a natural progression and the way that a farm should be scaled up to be a better producer of, of food, but I think it's actually more complicated than that. Uh, the recent successes of the urban farming movement can be attributed to the people who primarily set out to grow fruits and vegetables to, be, to address the issues of access to these, uh, to access these foods in the inner city. Uh, but now we have people coming along, scaling things up in a way that is less healthful, less sustainable, and in a way that harms animals. And that's where we start um, basically, I think, running into problems. Uh, we've already seen multiple instances, of, mul multiple instances of cruelty, neglect, and routine harm to animals taking place at the hands of urban homesteaders, but these situations are completely avoidable. If you look at the bigger picture, the problems we face are in our, in our cities, you see that agriculture, animal agriculture is not a silver bullet solution, but it's actually something that will cause more harm and have less benefit than simply growing crops. So Neighbors Opposed to Backyard Slaughter started when a group of us started hearing stories like the one that broke last year uh, about an urban homesteader in Oakland who was killing rabbits and selling rabbit pot pies on the farm stand. So to me, this was frustrating to um, myself and other people in my social circles because Many of us were volunteers at the Oakland Animal Shelter and worked for animal rescue groups uh, in the Bay Area. Um, we were out in Oakland trying to save the lives of rabbits and people who live less than a half a mile away from a grocery store are killing them as a hobby. And since rabbits are the third most surrendered animal in animal shelters nationwide, it was especially frustrating to see people breeding these animals knowing that many of them would probably end up in a shelter one way or another. So to people in the animal rescue world, these types of situations are all too familiar. Up until this point, we hadn't been aware of the fact that rabbits were becoming a more popular livestock animal among urban homesteaders. And it was especially shocking to, to hear about a person who was so brazenly breaking the laws pertaining to animals, uh, killing rabbits and selling non-USDA approved meat in a very public and open way. So until that time, like many people, we had the idea that urban farming, neighborhood gardens, and backyard farms were about growing crops primarily. Um, we saw a similar reaction at one of the, the first Oakland Planning Commission meetings that we um, went to, and it was uh, uh, scheduled to address urban farming. So one of the, the planning commissioners who was there, uh, whose name is Michael Colbruno, was really shocked 
that people were raising and slaughtering animals and trying to legalize this activity uh, that's currently illegal in Oakland under the umbrella of urban farming. So he felt that the animal agriculture folks were, were trying to basically sneak this policy under the radar. Um, so that's why we chose the name that we, we did. Uh, backyard slaughter is the issue that keeps getting overlooked or glossed over when we're talking about the new trend of raising animals in cities. Um, our goal is to advocate for a reasonable urban farming policy by calling attention to the fact that some people who say they want backyard chickens for eggs and some people who say that they want goats to mow their lawn are actually intending to kill and eat them. And this fact is not explicitly stated when new ordinances are proposed, and I'll explain why. Um, Oakland, for example, was, was going to pass what was referred to as a minor code, revi uh, minor code revision excuse me, um, without any public process, which would allow people to raise and slaughter animals with no meaningful government oversight. So we, had we not actually spoken up on this issue and started organizing, this, this law would already be in effect. So what we're talking about today in some ways is a cautionary tale for other cities because oftentimes the, the ways in which livestock animals are deregulated happens in a way that is not completely honest and open. If farmed animals are allowed to be raised and killed in cities, it is clearly not a good thing for those animals. It doesn't do anything to help people achieve, achieve food security, and it's also a, a very divisive issue. So you don't have any of these problems uh, growing crops. Uh, the way this all happens once you've seen the pattern enough times is actually pretty predictable. And so I'll sort of like lay out the, the, the blueprint for you so you can see that uh, the way that this policy gets made. Um, hopefully this will help other cities avoid some of the pitfall, pitfalls that are associated with the proliferation of animals being farmed in a dense urban environment. And, and one of these problems um, I have with the way farming animals is deregulated is the process by which city governments are essentially manipulated so that uh, urban homesteaders can have backyard chickens. Um, so one website, uh, backyardchickens.com, which is financially supported by factory farm hatcheries, is one of the central points of organization for people who want to farm animals in cities. Uh, but there are other similar online communities as well. Uh, these folks have figured out very effective ways to pass laws that would allow for chickens to be raised or slaughtered in cities. So you have a situation where all of a sudden emails and, and phone calls start flooding into a local municipal government about this sort of fringe issue, and, and the local officials um, just end up putting it on the docket. Um, here, so here are the, the two ways that people are pushing for backyard slaughter in cities. Uh, the first is uh, what I'll refer to as the animals ordinance which just focuses on how residents can keep chickens, goats, and other farmed animals as pets. And there's also the Urban Agriculture Ordinance, which is also referred to as food, a food policy, uh, which focuses primarily on issues relating to food, with a lot of, uh, unfortunately, it has a lot of wiggle room, generally, for people to breed and slaughter animals. Um, generally, the bulk of what's in an urban agriculture policy will be beneficial to the community, but the a large part of these food policies that relate to animals generally go against the goals of, of the larger policy itself. Um, so far from what we have seen, both uh, of these policies essentially have loopholes whereby animals are addressed in passing uh, with, or, or with a focus on everything but what the actual intent of keeping the animals is, leaving the door open to all manner of bad situations for those animals. Uh, in the recent past, both of these types of ordinances are pushed for by people who are interested in farming animals for dairy, eggs, and meat, but the, the language uh, and presentation of these policies generally would lead a casual observer to think otherwise. So the animals ordinance. Uh, in, in the animals ordinance, chickens, goats, and rabbits are put alongside ducks and, uh, sorry, dogs and cats in the text of the laws and in the public relations materials that are being distributed by animal farming proponents. Uh, slaughter is avoided in the text of these ordinances and generally only passing reference is even made to eggs. In El Cerrito last year, one of the city planners was given an assignment to research the feasibility of allowing residents to have goats, pigs, and chickens because a group of residents who were already keeping chickens in their backyards petitioned the city to have their activities legalized. But what people would actually be doing to these animals was very much treated in a dishonest way. In March 2011, a city planner gave a PowerPoint presentation to the El Cerrito City Council where he showed photographs of dogs, cats, and pigs all in the same context as pets. There was a lot of focus on minutia like lot size, noise abatement, other planning-related things, but very little mention was made of why animals were being considered in the first place. Uh, the planner referred to pigs, goats, chickens, and other farmed animals as pets multiple times in his presentation, but he never made any mention of these animals being killed for food. 
So to anyone attending the meeting, it would have seemed that they were proposing the creation of a new animals ordinance because a group of people wanted to have exotic pets as companion animals. Uh, when in Oakland, excuse me, when an Else Reader resident who, who runs a rabbit rescue and, and pet supply store asked if the mayor, asked the mayor if these animals would be allowed to be slaughtered, the mayor seemed genuinely surprised. Uh, she actually had her mouth hanging open and was staring back at the podium when the question was asked about slaughter. And, and she looked as if she had never actually considered that this might be a part of the policy at all. So people, you know, actually gave a round of applause at the end of that question and it seemed to be generally accepted. Um, at that point, there was a strong feeling on, on the city council that residents should not be permitted to slaughter animals under the proposed ordinance. There was a, there was a decision to, to research how, 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 to allow the peop, excuse me, how, how to allow people to keep these animals with a slaughter ban in place. But as the situation in El Cerrito unfolded, it felt very much like a, a bait and switch. So as the city council meetings progressed, and as the finer details of how the animal's ordinance should be crafted were hashed out, the slaughter issue was very much pushed to the bottom of the agenda. And so here's the tactic that's being used against the interests of animals in this case. After considerable, st considerable staff time and city money were spent creating a proposed animal's ordinance to please the residents who were lobbying to have backyard chickens and other animals, the same group of residents starts talking more and more about food producing animals and less and less about pets. So this is you know, what I refer to as scope creep. Um, it, you know, like in project management, the scope of the project is creeping from one thing to another. Um, when the public first hears about the policy change, it, it sounds very innocuous and even beneficial to animals and residents. Um, but incremental changes are made over time so that what you end up with is totally different, a totally different policy than what you started with. In the case of El Cerrito, pets are now livestock. Uh, later, later on in the process, the public Sorry, later on in the process, the, the general public still think um, of chickens as pets as a part of this ordinance. So unless people are really following city council meetings closely, the harmful policy can go through with minimal opposition. So the true intent of the animals, or if the true intent of the animals ordinance was stated up front, it would have been more likely to be defeated, actually. However many people there are who don't want chickens next door, there are twice as many people who don't want chickens being slaughtered next door. So, Thanks. So um, pretty soon the officials started saying that the, the slaughter ban was too restrictive and would cost too much money to figure out how to draft. And at that point, they essentially stopped working on it and allowed the loophole to remain open, despite the fact that we had compiled a long list of cities that banned slaughter, Oakland included. In some cases, such as Denver, the prohibition on slaughtering an animal is, is one sentence long. It says, no one shall slaughter any animal. But they stuck with the excuse that a ban would be too cost prohibitive to draft the effect of which is that um, people will probably be able to get away with slaughtering animals in El Cerrito starting in April. So now we'll go over the other way people try to get animal farming policies relaxed in cities. And Oakland is the case study for this. Uh, most of the goals of Oakland's urban agriculture ordinance are very good, but the inclusion of animals detracts from these stated goals. Oakland is creating a food policy to help people in food deserts get the foods that they most need, which are fruits and vegetables. Uh, we strongly support urban farming, and much of what's been going on in Oakland is really positive for our community, but the crux of the issue for us is that if animals are in introduced into our urban farming system and codified into law, it makes urban farming a very divisive issue. Everyone supports community vegetable gardens, crop growing, and so on, but when it comes to animal farming, it's a lot more complicated. Um, animal slaughter is currently illegal in Oakland. Despite this fact, we have a small but growing group of people raising and slaughtering animals on urban homesteads, and many of whom publish in books, articles, blogs, and, and et cetera, about the process and, and what they're doing. Uh, these people are pretty much local celebrities in certain literary circles, and m most of the urban farms and community gardens that are in public spaces are, are growing only plant-based foods. Um, but, but the more affluent um, urban homesteaders seem to be pushing things in the direction of adding animals to these crop-based urban farms as, again, a natural extension of what they're already doing. So the dictionary definition of agriculture includes animals as food, but plenty of people in Oakland, from what I've seen, don't actually know this. Um, when they're handing out flyers on the street, excuse me, um, most people say that they think including animals as a part of the food policy seems like a bad idea after I explain the issue to them. 
Uh, many people don't know the basics of how hens come from factory farms in the mail, how goats need to be constantly reimpregnated to get milk, how roosters and male goats are basically worthless in farming and are often slaughtered or abandoned, and how egg-laying chickens um, drop off their laying after about two years. So in, in Oakland, the, the urban agriculture ordinance animals are just sort of bundled in. Uh, as all of these, these basic details are glossed over because they would potentially cause people to oppose the inclusion of animals. Um, in Oakland, there is a nonprofit called the Oakland Food Policy Council, which is now coordinated by one of the animal farmers. It makes policy recommendations to the city, but from, from what I can tell, there still isn't any critical questioning about whether or not we need animals involved for urban farming to meet its goals, so there's a big blind spot here that needs to be addressed. Uh, the initial report that came out um, from the Oakland Food Policy Council had uh, no photos of animals at all, it had only a passing reference to animals in the text, and it was about 73 pages long and focused on all manner of things related to planning and zoning, but there was no talk of animals being bred or slaughtered. Uh, the process by which people could acquire animals under the, the proposed law and the way animals could be legally kept and slaughtered was not mentioned. It, it, and in response to the controversies surrounding animal farming, the Oakland Food Policy lobbied to have what's called a technical advisory group commit, uh, created to, to basically deal with animal farming as a separate issue. Um, two of the group members currently are now um, farmers who are already illegal, illegally killing animals in Oakland, and so, so, so we have to ask what the purpose of the technical advisory group is. And I would say that among other things, it's to advise the city on how to create laws for keeping animals for slaughter. Uh, so there are no animal advocates in this group. So what we ended up with is this tactic that is borrowed directly from industrial agriculture, which is the self-regulating animal farmer. Um, residents were never polled about whether or not they thought allowing animals to be farmed in Oakland was a good idea, and planners in Oakland said this would be too expensive and too difficult to process, but they didn't do um, a cost-benefit analysis of the potential expenses of deregulating animal farming, um, so that was that. Uh, the, the planning department in Oakland refuses to regulate any of the animal farmers, basically because planning staff are uncritically supportive of animal farming in the city. So the tactic with the urban agriculture ordinance, like the one that is pending in Oakland, is to just slip animal farming in through the back door to avoid public scrutiny over the details of breeding and slaughtering animals. Um, policy to allow animals to be raised for slaughter in cities doesn't just happen. In recent history, the idea of having a chicken or goat in your city lot is actually pretty new. Um, in the old days, there may have been some amount of farming going on in cities, but we also had rampant health problems, massive industrial pollution, a shorter life expectancy, and a whole host of other problems we don't want to resurrect at this point in history. So we need to look towards the future, not the past. A lot of what you hear in the news about urban homesteading and the new wave of animal farmers in cities is highly romanticized, but in reality, the animal still gets killed, and we're still using a lot of resources to raise that animal for food that is not much better for human health. So it also takes a lot of work to raise these animals. So if you're a low-income person just trying to get by, farming animals can cost a lot of money and use up a lot of time. And it's basically just a really high-stakes game. Um, for any policy, there needs to be a primary stated purpose. A policy should solve a problem without creating new ones. Urban agriculture ordinances and animal ordinances are two ways people can get, the law, get laws on the books that would allow people to breed, raise, and slaughter animals in cities where it wasn't allowed before. Uh, this is an issue that we hope more animal advocates would, will make their, their voice heard on. We can't allow animal farmers to be the only voice for animals. Um, people involved in ad advocating for food policy are strongly encouraged to make horticulture-based food policies and to leave animal husbandry out of it. Um, people in city governments should realize that if an animal's ordinance or an urban agriculture ordinance comes up, they should pay close attention to it, making sure that the laws will not harm animals and that the stated goals of the ordinance are actually what it achieves. Uh, we encourage people to look at this trend with a critical eye. What problems will be, in, excuse me, what problems will be caused by an increased number of people raising animals in our urban core? How is the issue being romanticized to obscure the reality of what breeding animals for slaughter entails? How can we use what we know today about the nutritional, environmental, and social, uh, social benefits of a plant-based diet to inform policies that are trying to achieve food security and food justice? And finally, do we really need animals to achieve these goals? Thank you. Aww.
Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, that's going to slide. No, that's going to stay, but that's going to be annoying, isn't it? OK. Hi. Just to be clear, that was Ian. I'm Colleen. So I don't know if that was clear, because there are two of us up here. Hi, everybody. Good to be here. Thank you so much to everyone who put this conference on. Hope, uh, we had dinner with Hope what, last year, and Hope said, I want to put a conference on, on sustainable eating. Just that was the, the seed that grew into this, and it's really a pleasure to be part of this. I do want to say that I'm here um, with Neighbors Opposed to Backyard Slaughter, and Ian, myself, Tim here, raise your hand here in the front, and Emily's hiding somewhere. Emily back there in the pink sweater. She's trying to hide, but she's wearing a bright pink sweater, so she can't hide. And Rick is here somewhere. Rick is here. And I don't think Mike and Mila are here, but Mike and Mila are also part of our team. So we're going to be at the table in the lobby there. Uh, so if you have any more questions, so I, um, in addition to what we're going to cover when I'm finished, then please do come to our table. We're definitely going to need your help. We've got postcards. We've got a mailing list. And we really, we really would love your involvement. It really has been such a pleasure to work with, with uh, all of my, well, if you have figured out the acronym is no BS, neighbors opposed to backyard slaughter, no BS. And I think one of the slaughter hobbyists recently in one of their blog posts tried to use that against us. They were like calling us the no BSers. I'm like, no, that's ours. This is the no, we're the ones who are saying we want no BS. Um, but I think they use that against us. And I think they also called us NIMBY vegans, which is really funny because that's what we call ourselves, neighbors opposed to backyard slaughter, that by definition is NIMBY, and we're vegan, so we're not trying to hide that either. And then they called us shadowy, which I really thought was fun. We're a shadowy organization, so, um, which I love. I love that. So I do. The secret life of NIMBY vegans. That's what we should change our name to, The Secret Life of Nimby Vegan. So this is an issue that's really close to my heart. I was really thrilled when I, not thrilled about this at all, but I was really thrilled when I found out that there were people who were really interested in, in making this something uh, visible and vocal um, to talk about because I've been watching this issue um, emerge for many, many years. Um, I saw this coming a million miles away. and. The reason I did is because when factory farming is focused on as the problem, the answer, the solution, then is small animal farming. And for me, factory farming is not the problem. It's the effect of a problem that sees animals as here for us to do with as we please. For me, the problem is the inherent violence in that mentality, the inherent violence of turning beautiful living beings into butchered bodies. To me, that's the problem. And if that's the problem, then the solution is compassion and nonviolence. And Urban, thank you. That's the answer. And yet, urban farming has become such a hot trend in cities all around the world. I mean, we're watching every day the news stories that are coming out of new cities who are passing, starting with what seems like innocuous animals, the hens who are just so romanticized. And beloved, we love hens. And that's another thing that the media continues to couch us as the anti-animal. We're the anti-chickens. They're the pro-chicken people. They're going to kill the chickens. To me, by definition, we are the pro-chicken people. But that's not how the media couches this. So this has become such a hot trend all around the world, really. But it's not the right to grow chard in raised beds. It's not the right to plant fruit trees in backyards that makes this such a heated issue. Would it were that simple? Would it were that innocuous? Despite the fact that countless city dwellers are living in food deserts where they have little or no access to healthful, affordable food, i.e. fruits and vegetables, that's not what this conversation has become about. Although the prevalence of food de deserts is very real and very serious and very solvable um, problem that exists in every major city, particularly in my beloved city of Oakland, the people dominating the urban farming discourse are those fighting for the right to keep and kill animals, not because they have to but because they want to and because they think they have the right to. And yet legalizing backyard animal agriculture, as Ian alluded to, would solve none of the problems 
in the city of Oakland or in any other city. Um, most cities have enough on their plates dealing with crime, dealing with violence, dealing with budget cuts and income inequality, underfunded public school systems and public health crises that we see all around the country. The, um, the rise in diabetes, the rise in heart disease, the rise in obesity, allowing for the pr proliferation of livestock and animal slaughter in backyards does nothing to solve any of these problems. In fact, it would make some worse and create some new ones. And Ian alluded to the city shelters. We see this in city shelters right now. Most city shelters are under Funded. Most of them are overwhelmed. Their animal control officers, their staff, their volunteers are overburdened with cases of neglect and abuse and abandonment and overpopulation of dogs and cats and companion rabbits. And as the popularity of the urban livestock trend increases, people are already filling their backyards with animals illegally illegally slaughtering them and certainly starting this whole trend, filling their animals. Um, filling their backyards with these animals, and we're seeing a glimpse of how the impact this is having on the city shelter system. You can just go to the Oakland website, for instance, and you can see the director talked about how they're struggling with the influx of farm animals uh, that are coming in, that's coming into the shelter. And um, I don't know if you saw it in the paper last year, but a slaughter hobbyist in Oakland um, had 21 rabbits confiscated from her home. She was raising them for human consumption. They were in horrible conditions. They were fed nothing but white rice. They had parasites. They were covered in feces. They were covered in urine. And they were being kept crammed in ti a tiny storage container in an apartment building. The animals were confiscated by animal control and rehomed through a network of volunteers in the Bay Area. I believe, Ian, you even fostered one of the rabbits habits, placing the burden for this botched hobby on the city shelter system and on rescue groups, right? And we're seeing this also in cities like, there's a Minneapolis uh, animal rescue group called Chicken Run Rescue, who has documented that since their city passed a law allowing chickens, the number of hens surrendered and abandoned has tripled. Even if rigorous regulations for keeping livestock animals are created, funds for enforcing these regulations are either non-existent or they'll be diverted away from dogs, cats, and companion rabbits. Either way, allowing more animals means more neglect, more abuse, more abandonment, and no resources for enforcement, for investigation, for rescue, and care. As a society, we haven't proven that we can take care of the animals we say we care about the animals we don't eat, the dogs and the cats, and the pet rabbits, and I say the companion rabbits because rabbits are certainly one of those animals in our society that we both care for and we eat at the same time. But until we commit to solving the problems with animals we say we care about, we should not be adding more animals into the mix. Thank you. <laughs> Allowing people to keep animals in their backyards doesn't solve that very real public health issue. I was. I'm talking about youth, children, adults in cities all around the country who even the county public health departments recognize as being diet related, the heart disease, the obesity, the rise in diabetes. Cities have a responsibility to advocate for the consumption of healthful plant foods, not more animal products. And one of the things that I'm always struck by as well is one of the things that we're accused of is being biased, that somehow we have some vegan agenda, um, which is always, always cracks me up because yes, I admit it. My agenda is compassion, and I am not going to apologize for that. But the truth is, I have an agenda, and you have an agenda, and you have an agenda, and you have an agenda, and someone who's eating animals has an animal eating agenda. So there's no such thing as they're unbiased, and I'm biased. I fully admit my bias, um, and that's towards compassion. The city needs to not advocate a policy that is actually going to lean towards the bias. It happens to be the status quo bias, but it's still a bias. Cities can easily and inexpensively implement programs and projects that increase access to healthful foods in food deserts and tackle those public health concerns at the same time. Expanding what is called urban farming or urban agriculture to include animals solves neither of these problems. It doesn't even reduce the monetary cost of food. Ian alluded to that. We see so many stories and posts and articles and even book entries from people who are doing this, who actually admit that it's very expensive to keep animals. 
And when people realize how expensive it is to properly care for animals, we see this all the time with dogs and cats. People who abandon their dogs and cats because they can't afford the care. Um, that's gonna continue to happen with these animals. And um, so what happens is they either abandon them, therefore jeopardizing the welfare of these animals, or they kill them, <laughs> jeopardizing the welfare and the life of these animals, or they'll cut costs, like we saw with the woman who was feeding her, uh, her rabbits only white rice. And that's, we know that's what happens. If you're raising them for any kind of profit, or even for your own uh, supplemental you know, income, or even just so that you can have them supplement your own food, food you know, your own intake of food, um, it, th you'll cut costs, because it means you have to put less out to get, to get more back. Many slaughter hobbyists and other proponents of keeping and killing animals like to talk about the fact that raising animals for human consumption is part of the natural cycle of life, and they accuse those of us who are opposed to it um, as we're, we're accused of denying the natural course of things. You hear this all the time. This is part of the normal course of things. This is a natural cycle of life. Artificially breeding animals, bringing them into the world only to kill them, is not part of any natural cycle I've ever seen. Last time I looked, obligate carnivores did not have a breeding program for the prey that they're, that they're designed to consume. I have never seen a lion breed a gazelle. And besides, <laughs> it's also part of nature not to kill animals in order to eat. In other words, nature is also made up of herbivores, animals who don't eat animals. In fact, there are more herbivores in the world than there are carnivores. It's very difficult to be a carnivore. So there are more herbivores in the world, but they're never used as the example of what is natural. We point right to the carnivores and as if they encompass the entire animal kingdom. Why don't we use the plant-eating animals as our model, as the barometer for our behavior? Why do we align ourselves with a carnivorous lion than with the vegetarian elephant? It's natural for them to not eat animals, so why don't we use them as a model? And the only answer I can think of is that would not be convenient, because that would not allow us to use that as an excuse and a justification for consuming animals. So not only are there the inherent ethical problems bringing animals into the world only to use them up and kill them, there's also the inevitable fact that half of the animals brought into the world in order for humans to consume milk and eggs would not be able to do that. Half of them would not be of the sex to do that. Half of them are males, and they do not produce eggs. Only females do, and they do not produce milk. Only females do. 50% are then killed upon birth because they have no value. So in the end, there is no such thing as a slaughter-free animal agriculture system, which, again, Ian alluded to, is why we, ta we, we called ourselves what we did, because no one was talking about this as being part of this cycle, this very unnatural cycle of breeding animals only to kill them. You cannot escape from slaughter on any side of the spectrum, whether we're talking about those precious hens whose menopause will eventually halt their egg laying, or those dairy goats whose male offspring are killed as babies because they lack the udders and thus the milk to make them worthy of living. And then, of course, in the end, they all go to slaughter. And though very few people actually want to live next door to someone keeping and killing animals, animals homeowners, homeowners and neighbors will have no say in the matter. I don't know anybody who wants to live next to someone who is killing animals, who's using the twist and crunch method, I think they call it, right, for, the, for killing rabbits, or hear the sounds of a dying goat or a distressed animal of any kind. Those of us who live in a city choose to live in a city, not, an, not a rural farm area, and changing policies that turn backyards into urban an, animal farms infringes upon the rights of these urban dwellers who would have no choice to endure it. And I ask, for what? To solve what? problem for whose gain. As a society, we recognize that the killing of cats and dogs is a violent act, but we like to pretend that the psychological effects, the effects are somehow different when animals we consider food are at the other end of the knife, simply because killing them for consumption is acceptable in our culture. But socially sanctioned violence is still violence, and killing animals in whatever environment and for whatever purpose has undeniable psychological and social consequences. I don't know if you heard about the story that was a few counties away just yesterday, a man who was killing cats and filleting them and consuming them. And the police officers talked about how they get more calls 
about someone hurting an animal than they do when someone's hurting a person, which is just says a lot about our own compassion. And so I would ask, what is the difference between killing the cat and killing a goat? What's the difference from the animal's point of view? None. And what's the difference in terms of the person who's doing the killing? There's even a name for this. There's a, um, I don't know if you've heard of the Sinclair hypothesis, referring to the author Upton Sinclair, who wrote, of course, uh, The Jungle in 1906 about slaughterhouse workers in Chicago. The Sinclair hypothesis postulates that the propensity for violent crime is increased by work that involves the routine slaughter of other animals. Maybe we just know this anecdotally, but there is more and more research that's coming out to demonstrate it. A study conducted by Amy Fitzgerald, a criminologist at the University of Windsor, finds that the act of killing, not the industrial setting, where the killing takes place is the sole factor that causes a local increase in crime. And the psychological effects on the one doing the killing are undeniable. Despite all the strange talk about how killing an animal somehow makes you closer to them. By definition, killing requires you to be distanced and desensitized. And those who haven't learned to do that yet are often traumatized by the act itself. Based on the precautionary principle alone, city officials should be fostering programs that teach compassion and empathy and not violence and desensitization. There is no problem this is a solution for. And when you read the blog posts and the op-eds of the folks who are vying to make animal slaughter legal, they know this too. They use this cloak and dagger approach when bringing the case before city planners, as Ian already talked about, and they also attempt to couch their arguments in romantic appeals to tradition, culture, and basic human rights is their newest, is their newest argument. They have a basic human right to kill animals. But what it comes down to is this. They want to do it because they think they should be allowed to. That's really what it comes down to. Farming animals has become sexy. It's become cool. It's become trendy. It garners bragging rights. And it gives you major locavore cred. It does not, however, solve any problems. It only creates them. On the flip side, policies that increase plant-based crops and gardens create no controversy and enable cities to build an equitable, sustainable food system that only helps and doesn't harm and that promotes life-giving and life-sustaining foods. And that is what we're trying to work on in our city of Oakland. And I ask everybody to get involved in their own cities. It has been so remarkable to tell you that with just a few of us, standing up and actually speaking up for the animals. We have accomplished so much. We've changed the conversation. We've made the conversation public. City officials are taking this very, very seriously. They haven't been able to slide this under. They thought this would be passed by now in Oakland. And it just took a few of us saying, whoa. And when we showed up at the city planning commission meeting and found that one of the city planning commissioners was also like, whoa, we were so thrilled to have that ally. But it only took a few of us standing up to make this possible. Now, it's not over. There's a lot of work to do, and it's become very, very heated. But as Ian said, there, there, there's nobody speaking for the animals in all of this. The people who are the animal slaughterers are the ones who are allowed to have the, the say in, in how these laws are going to be passed. So that is, that is the story of, um, of what we're doing and how we started this and really the proliferation of something that is happening all around the country. And I ask you to stand up, step up, and be a voice for animals, because if they don't have us, they don't have anybody speaking for them. Thank you very much. I'd like to take, thank you. Thank you. It's been somewhat disappointed, actually, disappointing, actually, because um, the way that this comes down in policy is that um, the people who work at the animal shelter sort of have their hands tied. Um, because they're sort of staffed level uh, in city government, they can't really take an active political role. And so they're forced um, basically by their higher ups who are you know, the planning department, the planning commission, city council, um, to basically only inform the process. So you know, they, they're sort of hamstrung in what they can actually say. So it hasn't been as strong a position as the, that we would have liked to see. You know, the Oakland Animal Shelter has said we're seeing an increase in these animals coming in. One thing that they've done is that they've closed what's called a night drop, which means that people can no longer drop off animals at the Oakland Animal Shelter uh, during off hours. So it's no longer an open admission shelter as it was before. Um, the result of this is neither here nor there, but that, you know, it shows that 
they're not able to intake as many animals as they're they're getting in. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a, we, 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 you know, you'd hope that the people who were there to advocate for the animals in the city would be able to be more vocal about it. Um, one of the pro-slaughter people who did a blog post, I think it was in Mother Jones, was this ridiculous post that was opposing everything that we are fighting for. And one of the things they did was call the animal shelter and get a quote from the director. And we were disappointed by that quote because it basically said, no, we're not really seeing a change in the number of farm animals. The one change we did see was a cockfighting operation that was a bust. And so we had an influx of roosters, but no, otherwise we're not. And when I wrote to the director and said, did you know that you were quoted or misquoted, she did not realize that that was what they were using. And she you know, basically said that's not what she said. So it is a very difficult political position that she's in, but, um, but we're trying to make her accountable. We're trying to make the city council. You know what? That's, well, I wrote five letters to the editor of Mother Jones, and nobody replied to me. So I don't. Nobody replied to me. Um, but I. Um, but she did ask what she. What, what do we think she should do? So we're working with her on. I think. Um, you know, maybe maybe becoming even more vocal about it. We. I think we have an opportunity to do that because I think she was really disappointed that she was um, that she was misquoted like that. Well, harming pets, animals who are pets, is illegal. So is slaughter. So is, so is slaughter. It is illegal right now, but people are doing it under the radar right now. But that's part of what we're trying to say is we want to make slaughtering all animals illegal. They, you know, our last meeting with the planning department made it sound like they want to put animals in these different categories, and for this you'd be able to do this, and for this you'd be able to do that. And then he said, let's just, say the, let's just say the animals that you don't have to kill. Let's just say the chickens and the goats. And we're like, mm. No, like you have to kill this animal. Like they're in the thing in the hatcheries. Like so we so we're there because these are people who do not know anything about animals, who are making these decisions about animals and animal lives. So um, so what we would want to do, you know, in our you know, what we would want to do is keep all farm animals out of the policy and should not be in a food policy at all. Um, if anything, if chickens were labeled, you know, where they're in the category with rabbits and cats and dogs, so that you cannot slaughter them. But you can't get out of that. I mean, the goats, no, one's, no one has a goat for a pet. Not really, not really. They're using them for use. But yeah, I mean, to answer this long way of saying yes, it is, it is illegal. It is illegal to harm animals.